Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure. It's actually an honor because I've worked with Tony at no less than three of his projects. And despite my contribution, all of these tunnels were great successes. Tony regards himself as a tunneling engineer with a layman's interest in geology. He came to South Africa in 1963 to work on the 83-kilometer Orange Fish Tunnel, a major component of the Orange River project. Afterwards, he joined Kiwi Stain and Partners in 1971 and worked on a wide variety of tunnels throughout South Africa. I first met Tony on the Lesotho Highlands Water Project where he spent nine years. The second time I met him was in, on the Taiwan High Speed Rail after which he went to China and then returned to South Africa in 2003 to work on Gau Train and the Ngula Pump Storage Scheme. He's a member of the History and Heritage Panel of the South African Institute of Civil Engineering and is currently working with a subcommittee who is preparing a book to commemorate 50 years of operational use on the Orange River project. We look forward to today's talk, Tony. Okay. Right, well, let me start off by pointing out that I'm going to be talking about some of the roughly 600 tunnels which have been built for civil engineering purposes over the last 160 years or so, whose aggregate length is approximately 700 kilometers. So there's no mining work going on here. More detailed information on many of the tunnels mentioned in this presentation can be found in the two Sankop publications which I've put the covers on at the top of the screen. David Easton, um, who's still active but not quite so active as he used to be, uh, started off the database back in the year before the year 2000 and then when uh, Norman Schmidt and I produced a, a book for the, um, the ITA conference in Durban, the World Tunnel Congress in the year 2000, we produced a book which tried to summarize most of the major tunneling work which had been done up to that date. So let's go on from there. It's generally accepted that South Africa's first tunnel to be put into service was one on the outskirts of, of Hankey at the Hankey Mission in 1844. That's the same year that James Henry Greathead of soft tunneling fame in London was born in Grahamstown just over 150 kilometers away. And there's the Hankey Mission back in those early days of the 19th century. It was a 100 meter long semicircular five meter diameter irrigation tunnel that was constructed under the direction of William Philip son of missionary John Philip. And uh, it's in this tiny, it goes, cuts through this tiny neck of this oxbow on the Humptooth River. And there's the village of Hankey over there on, on the right. And here is me and the tunnel many years ago, 19, 1997, with this marvelous material, this Enon conglomerate, which is easy as anything to, to excavate and has a pretty marvelous stand-up time. I mean, there you are, there it is from 1844 to the present day and it's still, still standing. And there is the Hamptooth River in flood, which it was when we visited there in January 97. And here's the irrigated lands to the south of the ridge, which benefited from that tunnel. But this may not have been the first tunnel in South Africa. In 1835, whilst holding military post in the area, Andrew Heddy's Bain was granted a farm in the Eastern Cape, which became known as Block Drift Farm, in what is now the town of Alice. In a letter dated the 3rd of July, 1847, Bain, in referring to an irrigation channel he had built on the farm, described how this carried a large stream of water that I led out of the Chumi through a small tunnel. So now here's the farm and here's the town of Alice and um, up here where I've got the mark D2 is where the, the dam, small little dam was built. The first attempt was down here but that was abandoned. You've got the Lovedale Mission, which is here, which benefit from the, the water from the furrow, which comes, comes down in this direction here. This is a map 
um, hand-drawn map of the time, which was showing the various features. The furrow coming across here is the dam up there on the right. In after Bain's death, in 1864, his family fell on hard times and they petitioned the Cape government seeking compensation for the resumption of the farm allocated to him by His Excellency Sir Durban for services rendered. Amongst those giving evidence to the select committee was a, uh, Andrew Hedges Bain's son, Thomas Bain. And he will hear about more later on. The committee's report contained several references to a tunnel. The committee chairman's statement made on the 24th of June included these words. He, AGB, spent all his money in building a house, clearing lands and leading water out of the Chumi River, and in doing so made, I believe, the first tunnel in South Africa for leading water through. Several years ago, my family and I visited the area and found a small dam at the position labeled D2 in the earlier slides we could clearly make out the remnants of what was once the freely flowing furrow, furrow leading water from the river towards the Lovedale mission. But we could find no evidence of Bain's small tunnel, which is said to have led water out of the river and into the furrow. So there's a mystery there which remains to be resolved. Our history of tunnel building in Southern Africa continues with Baines and his building of the mountain pass which bears his name, which rises up from Wellington into the interior. The construction of this epic 19th century endeavor was well documented and has been retold on many occasions in recent times, but from a road building perspective. And these are typical sort of reminders of that whole grand epic piece of work. But now, by now, Bain clearly had an obsession to build a road tunnel. And here there was a need, in his mind, of building not just one, but two of them to shorten the overall route of the pass. His original plan was to construct one near the foot of the pass and a second one near the top. His superiors felt he was going a bit too far and restricted him to the building of the one near the bottom. This is his sketch map that he made after he, uh, he made an inspection of the potential route, which is a bit difficult to read, but the tunnel is somewhere down there. It's more readily picked up on the one in 50,000 present day map with Wellington being there. And those of you who know Easter Toll, which is the place at the top of the pass, uh, where the toll gate was, will perhaps pick up the, the story. There's a there's a spur, there's a mountain spur here, where the tunnel was in fact excavated. Here's an aerial view showing the the spur of the hill, and until recently, the east and west portals were readily identified by uh, signage. Uh, but that, that signage is gone, so you have to know your way around to be able to find it these days. Anyway, the excavation, of course, was in the very decomposed Malmesbury sedimentary rocks, and it began in March 1849. And Bain reported that a tunnel of 336 feet in length had been perforated through a high hill of decomposed shale which is 14 feet high, and when widened to the extent intended, will be 12 feet broad. He noted that the ground cuts like cheese. The tunnel was fully excavated and evidently had sufficient stand-up time to allow its use by construction traffic for several months. He had planned to line the tunnel with clay bricks, and a supply of bricks had been prepared for firing. But before these were burnt, there was some kind of a collapse which led to the western entrance to the tunnel becoming blocked. There had been heavy rain and one can only assume that there was a collapse of ground at the entrance to the tunnel. No substance of ground was observed above the tunnel. Nonetheless, the tunnel was abandoned and the road taken around the spur of the hill, as I've indicated just now. 
AGB had lost out on his wish to successfully complete a road tunnel, but tunneling was in the family genes. It fell to his son, Thomas Bain, to build the oldest still extant road tunnel at the top end of Cogman's Kloof Pass, as Henny well knows. Um, here's Ashton and Montague, and here's the pass, Cogman's Kloof Pass coming up, and the little spur of of rock there, outcrop, which had to be negotiated. It's really not much more than a rock arch, but I th think we can say that it is a tunnel because the length is slightly greater than the span. And here it is. And that's Henny's picture on the left, which led to a lot of discussion the other day. And there's, uh, sorry, yeah, and there's one from the other side, which I got from, from somewhere else. And of course, the famous fort up there at the top. And strangely enough, what many people think to be the first railway tunnel, which was the NZASM tunnel at Waterfall Boven, also had at the time of the Second African South African War had a fort on the top. Um, that actually I think is a tree. I don't think it is it. But anyway, the two portals, the, the old Sazam tunnel there on the left, and you've got the, the new road tunnel, which was built in the 1970s on the right. As I say, many people think it was this railway tunnel, which is quite an interesting one because it got a, a rack and pinion uh, system for operation, um, or did have. Um, is the subject of um, our SA Institution of Civil Engineering um, History and Heritage Panel Award for the current year. So there will be an article describing that in some length in due course. Um, the first railway tunnel was actually built was in the Hicks River Valley. And it was called the Hicks River Tunnel Number One between Ostplatz and Matrusburg. It was completed in 1876, was unlined except at the portal and was 180 metres long. It was abandoned in 1930 when there was a change in the route alignment. And it is, of course, not far from the site of South Africa's longest railway tunnel, the 13,3 Hex River No. 4 tunnel, that was completed in 1988, and which was the subject of a major constructional contractual dispute. And there they are, there's the Dorns. And then the Hex River Tunnel, the old one in 1876 is there. And the longer tunnel is just over there, just to the north of it. So now we come to water tunnels. The first tunnel built for conveying municipal water was the Woodhead Tunnel on the western side of Table Mountain in Cape Town, of course. Work began on it in August 1887 and it was completed in 1891. It's just 1,35 meters wide and 1,725 meters high, I shouldn't read, and 360 meters long. It was replaced in 12, uh, sorry, replaced by the 1,285 meter long Apostles Tunnel, which was completed in 1963. And those who know Ross Perry Davis will know that that was something he was very proud of having been involved with that. And here's the, the portal of the Woodhead Tunnel. And here are the two tunnels, the Woodhead Tunnel, 1891, and the Apostles Tunnel. And um, here we've got the 12 Apostle Mountains there with Camps Bay down there. So, so much for the 19th century and first tunnels of one kind or another. However, Going back to railway tunnels for a bit, the need for them increased as the railway system developed over the country. By 1910, only 11 tunnels had been built with a total length of 1,9 kilometres. But things warmed up after that because between 1911 and 1969, 126 tunnels were built with an aggregate length of 71,6 kilometres. Since then, a further 55 rail, rail tunnels have been constructed with a combined length of 62 kilometres, 
And quite a bit of that, I guess, would be on the coal line. In fact, I seem to remember the total length of the coal line tunnels was something like 20 or 30 kilometers. Now we come to water tunnels. Uh, in KZN, you had the Nagel to Durban Heights aqueduct, uh, or series of aqueducts, which were built between 1947 and 1964, which involved the construction of 32 tunnels with an aggregate length of 35 kilometres. The Ananda Wiggins aqueduct consisted of five tunnels with a total length of 17,6 kilometres and was completed in 1994. Then, we come to major projects and in the Eastern Cape, uh, we've heard a bit about the Orange Fish Tunnel and how it was built between 1968 and 1975. And in 2025, it will have been in use for 50 years. Um, and of course, the Orange Fish Tunnel is a major component of the Orange River project. And here's a, a sketch which um, gives a quick glance of that. The Harib and van der Kloof Downs controlled the, the downstream flows to the lower reaches of the Orange River. And the Orange Fish Tunnel is, of course, fed from water from the Harib Dam. And it provides a vital source of water to Port Elizabeth. I believe Port Elizabeth, um, about 75% of its water supply comes from the, the tunnel water. And there are a number of towns in the, in the district, which, at least in the whole area here, which uh, get water from the Orange Fish Tunnel. And Stainsburg, it has the unique, has the unique uh, situation where it's actually drawing water directly from the tunnel at Shaft 7. That's a nice little story for another occasion. But of course, the whole citrus industry and other forms of ag agriculture in the Eastern Cape just wouldn't be existing today without that water. The annual discharge through the tunnel is 732 million cubic meters per annum, which is about 23 uh, cubic meters a second, if you look at it in those sort of terms. So that's the route of the Orange Fish Tunnel in a bit more detail. Um, and uh, we had a major flooding incident at Shaft 2 and dealing with that delayed construction in that area by 18 months. And then south of Shaft 4, there was a methane fire, which delayed construction by, by nine months. Uh, and of course, one of the benefits of this type of layout is that you, from each shaft, you're constructing headings in each direction. So, if, so the, although there was a stoppage here, it just meant that the guys from shaft five coming back had to go further than they had originally planned to do in order to make up for that delay. And likewise here, the approaching um, uh, drives from one south and three north also mitigated the, the effect of the 18 month delay there. Then this is on the outlet section, um, the contractor, the Penta JCI, were very proud of the fact that they had this Jacob sliding floor, um, which is a very cunning device to assist in the operation of getting muck cars in and out from behind the um, mucking equipment when the mucking equipment was in there at the face. And um, at Tierbus, we had quite a involved underground works with the water coming from upstream coming in here. And then you have uh, two, where's this cursor gone? You have two main valve penstock uh, tunnels trifurcating into, um, into a total of six valve, uh, feeders to the valves, which are in here. They were, um, at the time, the largest pepper pot valves um, in the world. They're 1,8 meters in diameter. And um, they um, basically, you've got a solid piece in, in the center, which um, it, uh, the, the valve, the, the body of the valve has got lots and lots of holes in it, uh, like a colander. 
vertical colander, and then as you raise and lift the solid piece in the middle, so that uh, uh, varies the, the flow of water actually going through into uh, the lower part of the chamber and then out to the outlet. There was also provision for uh, a turbine hall, uh, but really the total potential um, power which could come uh, from the use of that would only be about 10 megawatts. And in fact, all there is now is just a small uh, unit, maybe a few <clears throat> hundred kilowatts just to provide uh, power for operation of these underground works in the local, local village. Um, then, of course, um, after Orange Fish, you had the Yonkers Hook uh, Tunnel Scheme, which is a little closer to home to us here, with tunnel, a total length of tunnels of about 35 kilometres, which were built between 1973 and 1981. And here's a diagrammatic layout of those, with Stellenbosch being up there and Franschuk there and Filia's door over here. So I think we're beginning to feel that we're a lot closer to home when we look at this diagram. Then, of course, um, we come to Lesotho Highlands. And uh, I had hoped to get a more up-to-date version of this very nice key map, uh, but I haven't been able to thus far. Uh, we've been talking about Pahadi Hadi, which is somewhere up there on the Senku. And that's going to be the next major thing with a 30 kilometer, just over 30 kilometer length of tunnel coming from there across back to, to Katsi. And Henny and I were involved with the transfer tunnel and, and Andrew Tanner was very much involved with the overall uh, <clears throat> original planning of the whole scheme, which of course then leads to, oops, leads water to the Moela power station and from there into the delivery tunnel and thereby onto the Ash River going further north. And then here you've got the Mahali Tunnel, another 30 kilometer tunnel, which was uh, phase 1B. So that's a bit of an introduction to, to that. And um, those are the lengths of the... Uh, I'm wondering if there's something wrong here. No, no, that's right, that's right. Now there was to be um, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, going on, we have heard, as, as, um, as John was saying, that the big documents for the construction of the Pali Hadi Tunnel is expected to be out very soon, and then we should see some renewed action in, in Lesotho. And then, of course, there have been pump storage schemes. The steam bus in uh, uh, with 1979, 180 megawatts, and the Drakensberg, 1,000 megawatts in 1981, Palmeet, 400 megawatts in 1987, Ingula, 1332, and they've still got a couple of ones which are maybes, the Tabatsi one uh, up there at Steelport, and Kabong in, in Lesotho, but um, there doesn't seem to be much incitement excitement about pump storage schemes at the moment because the problem is when you go and come to the pumping phase you need power and where do you get power from Eskom these days you don't um road tunnels are a bit limited we've had nine road tunnels which have been built in south africa with a total length of 6.2 kilometers the longest being of course the huguenot tunnel we saw the first use in South Africa of ground freezing and vacuum drainage techniques. And we've got the possibility in the future of one at De Beers Pass to replace the Fenrenen Pass. Um, I was involved in some preliminary studies on, on that, as I think a number of other people have as well. And we kept on being told that when the traffic flow reached a certain level on Fenrenen, they just simply had to have this alternative done. But I hear nothing. I don't know if anybody here has heard anything further about that. And of course, by far the greatest amount of tunneling has been done using drill and blast techniques. And the first use of a hard rock TBM in South Africa was on the Cookhouse Tunnel, which was completed in 1974, which formed part of the Orange River project. And here are some photos of that machine. 
and of the 13 kilometers of tunnel length, 11 were done by this, uh, which to modern eyes looks at rather strange machine because it has this proboscis here uh, with um, boring a very large pilot. And that is, and then that anchors uh, the uh, machine and provides the thrust. This you having a, a telescopic cylinder uh, there, and of course it it is uh, assisted to some extent by the equipment there as well. And then of course considerable use of Griffin machines was made on the Lesotho Islands Water Project and Henning will recognize these two pictures immediately. This being the Atlas Copcomb TBM which started at the, at the intake just north of the Madiwiwatsu Bridge. And here this was the Robbins machine which was at Klotzi which was um, being going to be used to drive from Klotzi southwards towards the intake. And more recently, two very specialized machines have been used in South Africa. There was a slurry TBM used on the Durba Harbour Tunnel. And then more recently, we had the EPB TBM for the Rosebank Kalani Drive on Howe Train. Other future projects that will require tunnels are the Unkamaji Water Transfer Scheme in KZN. Uh, apparently, the, the system feeding the Marisburg area is under strain and that could provide a lot of relief once that scheme um, is eventually uh, put in hand and the how train rapid rail system has got five stages of, of um, future development anticipated and the first extension phase is has been decided upon uh, in some detail and they're just waiting for um, approve financial approval of finance to to go ahead with that. So uh, I seem to have got here rather quicker than I was expecting. <laughs> but uh, as I said at the beginning, um, we've had something over 600 tunnels have been built uh, for civil engineering purposes in southern Africa, with an aggregate length of about 700 kilometres. It's a proud record, but it's far from being a world record. In the 1970s, the South African mining industry's routine development work amounted to approximately a thousand kilometers of work every year. And although it's probably quite a lot still, I'm sure it's not quite as much as that today. And when I was working in mainland China in 1999-2000, I was told that the annual production of civil tunneling work was approximately the same, seven, well, 700 kilometers. So, um, it's a proud record that we've got, but it's not a world record. And we have plenty more to do in this part of the world when the time is right and the money is made available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Right. I'm trying to find <laughs> the stop share. Right. Okay, we're back again. Here we go. Tony, just to get the ball rolling, though, those tunnels you talk about under Table Mountain, do they go across under the mountain to to the um, to the other side of the mountain just for water transfer? Yeah, look, there, that was uh, from the very early days, and this is just a takeoff from the the Dyser River below uh, the dams on the top of Table Mountain. Um, mm -hmm. In that, that sense, they are just simply um, going. Going through a divide, the, the toe of a possible ridge, if you like. If you think of the toe yeah. of a ridge, it's basically going from the Dyza River uh, across to the western side, and then it comes around what's known as the pipe track. You've got pipes which bring the water around to the um, purification works on, on uh, below Table Mountain. Okay, and then then just another question: um, the the tunnel, the, the orange fish tunnels, were, were those all built in in Karoo sediments, or what? What's the? Yeah, yeah we're in the mid middle of Beaufort, um, so it's all sandstones, siltstones, and sandstones, and occasionally dolerite. Um, 
in the total length of the tunnel, it was anticipated there would be about 10% would be in dolerite. And that was the way it actually turned out. And we mm -hmm. had Robbins uh, come out. Um, he had just been doing a lot of work in Poatina, um, Australia, um, Tasmania, I think it is, uh, where his machines have been very successful in the mudstones and similar rocks there. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the problem was the, the dolerite. He said at that time that he could get through the dolerite, mm -hmm. but not economically. And of course, um, before the project began, when you have to make a decision about whether you're going to use a machine or not, that was too much of a gamble. Mm -hmm. uh, so in fact, if we were to do another orange fish tunnel, certainly TBMs would be used. On, on that orange fish tunnel, uh, they were using shafts to access and drive. Was that just in the 60s? Was it just like the norm for because the mining guys did it? Uh, what what made them decide that rather than the use of edits? Well, uh, if, you were to, if I was to take you back to that long section, you see that um, some of the shafts were quite deep. The deepest one, I think, was 1,500 meters. And that was about 500 meters. Um, and in fact, um, this is exactly where the South African uh, component of the contracting organizations really came to the fore because um, of conventional vertical shaft development being an absolute uh, uh, thing with, with our mining industry. Uh, I mean, certainly on the outlet section, we had two, we had a number of deeper shafts and they were all done using conventional mine sinking, uh, mine, uh, shaft sinking tech, techniques as we've known it in, in South Africa for many, many years. Uh, particularly so on the plateau section where the shafts were deeper. Uh, in the case of the intake section, they were all, um, from the point of view of access for construction, they were in fact inclined uh, addits. Uh, yeah, and what was the, the advance rate like? Uh, oh, I'm afraid I'd have to look it up again. But um, they, sorry, I, I would rather I would rather no look it up, yeah. um, rather than taking t too much of a wild guess. Yeah, but I, I just have a, a feeling that we. No, I'd rather not give a figure off. Oh, okay, uh, I see. Uh, Andrew Tanner says something about your slide on the Katsi Tunnel that he yeah. said Mahali Katsi Tunnel was 36 kilometers, not six. Uh, is 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 there? Yeah, a... yeah I've got I've got some something wrong with that slide. Um, you're quite right. I mean, the uh, Mahali Tunnel is is as you say, what, uh, well over 30 30 kilometers. Uh -huh. And tell me, is the jury out now on on is it the Ash River or the Axel River that that it's that it goes into? Uh, no, I don't know. That. I don't know that story. No, no, Afrikaans is us, and there's been there's been a discussion whether it's Axel or Ash. Yes, I, I've anyway. but I certainly don't know the answer. No, no it's just, <laughs> um, just one of those. That's the sort of you knew already. Okay, that's fine. Good. Tony, uh, Tony, sorry, just one more on. Uh, do, do you know if they've been back uh, uh, inspecting the, the delivery or the transfer tunnels and what's the condition like if they did? I've not had any update on you know how the tunnel has been standing up since we were in it for the last time. Yeah, um, no inspections are done from time to time and I don't think they've come across any, any significant need for repairs in the tunnels themselves. Um, no. I myself was involved in the inspection of the Mahali Tunnel about three or four years ago, and there does seem to be uh, there do seem to be some problems there, because that was um, also done by TBMs, uh, but with a precast lining, which then had to be uh, pre graveled and, and grouted up subsequently, and there's a certain certain amount of problems with voids which we found behind the lining which have to be attended to at some some stage or another but of course okay. this is more it's the, the interesting thing do you in fact 
do is we did with a transfer tunnel uh, in working in basalt, it's, it's always when at the time it was a big question, how well will the basalts behave over to exposure over a long period of time? And uh, as you very well know, and many others do too, that some of the basalts are not durable and others are. And the, the philosophy on the transfer tunnel was, well, we'll see if we can get away with any lining the, the minimum amount. And uh, there's one section in particular, I well remember the northern end of the transfer tunnel where you had very, very good um, non-amygdaloidal basalt for more than a kilometer which could very easily have been left unlined. But, you know, you have to take a, have to take a decision. And I believe, and I believe, you know, with Pahadi Hadi, um, I, I believe the documentation, and maybe John can put us right on this, has been based on the, on the, on the principle of um, driving the tunnel with a precast lining being built uh, as you advance. But I think uh, it might still be open to the possibility of alternatives from bidders. John, have you got any comments? Um, on yeah, yeah. The as as far as I know, it is going to be um, yeah segmentally lined. But yeah, as, I'm not sure if they're leaving the door open for alternatives. But hmm. I think based on what happened on the transfer tunnel, you know. I think it was yeah. 70 odd percent of it needed lining one one form or another. So as you say, there was one or two good sections in there that didn't need it, but it obviously wasn't worth interrupting the lining process to um, to leave those gaps. Right. It's more economical to just keep going, as I recall. Yeah. And on the car train, uh, Tony, uh, you said there's a the next tunneling section is, is almost approved. Where is that actually going to go? And how long is it going to be? You think the, the uh, length of that tunnel? Look, I don't know the length of of the of tunneling which will be required in this next phase. Um, it would be um, starting at the southern end at Santon Station, which of course would require tunneling for the first few kilometers until you get sufficiently out of the congested area. Um, so, sorry, I'm just starting my video again. Um, so I haven't actually been involved in the um, thinking and detail planning. Uh, so I, I don't know what sort of percentage of the new routes will be in tunnels. Um, except of course, if you think if you're going out from Johannesburg in a westerly direction, you've got the Vitwaterzand Ridge and where you penetrate that, you're going to have to be uh, in tunneling, of course. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there are a certain amount of tunneling will be required, but um, I don't know the figures. Thank you. And then, Harry, are you on the call here, Harry? Harry had a question about flooding in the Orange Fish Tunnel. Does does that make sense? It's well, underwater as we speak. <laughs> no, I mean it was it was an interesting situation, and um, yeah, you know, people have been looking for this source of water ever since. But the point is that they were doing um, advanced probing, and um, with the evidence of being water, there was, there was a certain amount of pre-grouting being done. But they ended up uh, having a situation where you had, it was quoted in some uh, ways as being a million gallons an hour or a thousand cubic meters um, an hour. Uh, and it certainly was a major flood which came into the tunnel and flooded the, um, the length of tunnel going to the north of shaft two as well as to the south, which is where the in incoming water came. And then, of course, it went right up the shaft. Uh, and um, the way it was solved eventually was to have they drilled vertical holes around a large circle, which enclosed the area which had been flooded, of course. And with um, 
very concentrated grouting work from the surface, unfortunately, because there it was not terribly deep, only a few hundred feet at the most, two or three hundred feet, they were able to, to seal the water off and then pump the water out and resume, resume tunneling. But um, one of the most amusing pictures that one finds in going through the records are people making inspections from a fishing dinghy um, in, mm -hmm. in the tunnel. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And, and, and Tony, that big sort of um, junction box that you showed with um, pipes and valves and, and everything in, in the middle of the tunnel, was that to slow down the water flow or control it? No, it is, it is simply the control mechanism. You know, mm. it's your tap for the tunnel. You know, how much water do you want to be let out of the tunnel? Okay. Uh, with these very large quantities of water and, and the need to, to vary those um, in, very, in a very controlled way, you needed mm. to have uh, these uh, large valves uh, in order to, to do just that. And, and, and that infrastructure is also working like it was built to do many years later, 50 years later. Well, yes, although I have picked up that they have had to um, do some repair work on at least one or two of those valves. I mean, what happens is that the whole system is, is, is turned, is closed off for about a month every year to allow inspections to be made and to deal with any repair work which might be required. Mm. And um, it's, it's a long journey. I, I, I went on one such inspection a number of years ago and we drove uh, uh, in an ordinary vehicle. Uh, no, it wasn't a fancy tunnel inspection vehicle. Uh, we went down into uh, the incline shaft at shaft two, then drove northwards to to the intake tower, mm. and then back to shaft two, and then went on all the way through to uh, the underground works, and that took a whole day to do. And then the following day, we went back at the underground works and went down to the outlet. So. Um, Yes, in fact, I'm quite keen to, to know when they're next going to be doing such a, a closure. It would be interesting to have take another look. Go, go and do a reminiscence trip. And yeah, I mean, I, I guess the fascinating thing is all of you guys and our amazing gold miners and deep level miners, you know, you, you could use those skills in many other places and, and credit to, to the people who did all that amazing work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sadly, I don't think many of those skills are left today. Graham Gabin. Yeah, hi, John. Yeah, I, I think it's a dying, um, it's a dying uh, uh, sort of uh, skill we've got at the moment, or we had, yeah. I'd just like to ask Tony there one question. Um, you seem to have left out all the tunnels that were constructed um, as the railway line was developed uh, from Durban inland in the latter part of the 19th century. Well, look, um, you're right in as much as I made some reference just by very providing some very global numbers. And um, Norman Schmidt, um, has, who was very much a, a railways tunneling man, uh, who was involved in a lot of that tunneling work that you're referring to, wrote this uh, up very well in that uh, one book that we produced in the year 2000. And uh, if you gave me your contact details and, we, and you wanted it, I would be very happy to, to copy that section of, of the book and, and uh, email it to you. Well, thanks, Tony, I'll do that. Uh, I did find uh, some interesting uh, material on a website that deals with the development of those railway lines in quite some detail and there is reference to how uh, you know, the, they had to sort of do the, the tunneling as well as, you know, uh, given the technology of the time where they had to, you know, uh, do a very long deviations to cope with the topography. And uh, I'll send you some of the links so you might find it interesting. Thanks. Well, that we very, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Um, as I say, as was mentioned, I'm a member of this history and heritage panel that we have in the South African Institution of Civil Engineering. And uh, we're interested in, in getting good information on, on, on that older stuff. 
um, and that could be very useful. Okay. Any more questions, ladies and gents? Not a, question. Not, a, not a question as such, just a comment on the delivery tunnel uh, from uh, Muela through to the Ash River when they went under the, the Caledon. Obviously, the Caledon is the boundary between South Africa and Lesotho, so they actually fenced off a large piece of territory and the South African border was moved to the outside of that bit of territory and the Lesotho border to the southern side so that people went in from South Africa and were in no man's land and in from Lesotho and were in no man's land so they could go across the river and underneath through the siphons and whatever without actually going through a border because the border was no longer the centre of the river for the construction. <laughs> and how far below were they, Andrew? Uh, the siphons weren't that deep. I uh, don't know if Tony knows the siph how far down the siphons were. I mean, obviously they were all steel siphons, um, but they weren't very very deep under the river as far as I mm. recall. I mean, mm. Can't remember. But there were several siphons and the siphons are actually the hydraulic constraint on the tunnel as far as we could tell from some recalculations of tunnel roughness, which is always the uncertainty when you're doing the hydraulics of the tunnels. How, how will it age? And there was quite a lot of work done on the transfer tunnel monitoring uh, hydraulic head loss through the tunnel with age and uh, Tony Boniface was heavily involved. Uh, sorry, uh, Christopher Lewin was heavily involved in all of that work. Okay. Yeah, and Jim Metcalf as well. And Jim Metcalf did some uh, long-term studies with water affairs on the age, aging effects of friction um, for the Orange Fish Tunnel. And if anybody is interested, I can pass that uh, information on to, to them. To, uh, Jordan, the younger, and Jimmy, Jim Metcalf wrote a, a paper on that topic. But, uh, yeah. Okay, and, and just going back to the question about the flooding on the orange fish, and, and I guess it's a, a, a bit further than that. I mean, was there loss of life, or were, uh, how, how was the health and safety in that um, building of that amazing tunnel 50, 50 years ago? Well, sadly, the overall record safety-wise was not all that fantastic. I, I can't remember the figures. It's a long time ago. But, I mean, in terms of the flood, there was... Um, I'm not aware of any, any accidents associated with the flood. Mm. Unfortunately, with the methane fire, um, there wasn't anything, there weren't any major industries. I, wouldn't, I think there was one loss of life at the methane fire itself. But the, the whole question of methane and how you've got to be careful uh, is so, so important that people can often overlook it. And, when they were closing up the works at Shaft 5, there was unfortunately a, a loss of life of, of several people when the, because of a pocket of methane had uh, collected there. And of course, you know, you're above the echo, so you can always expect, uh, it can always be a possibility. And even in Lesotho, on the Lesotho, on the transfer tunnel in the Klotzi area, uh, we at tunnel level we did have traces of methane but nothing nothing uh, which turned out to be dangerous but enough of a warning that you've got to be careful always test test your gases and i just Question. asked something john um tony I, I i my signal left for a little while so you may have talked about it and i may have missed it but in the western cape water tunnels uh, of the old Bullant uh, water plant. Uh, they did some, I believe, some freezing of mud uh, to be able to tunnel through. And I think it was also applied at the, uh, the Tuesklu uh, tunnel. Uh, yeah, is that just, something yeah, that is done often? No, very rare. But I mean, uh, you're quite right in the one end of the Huguenot tunnel that that technique was, was used. Uh, very successfully um, and they use vacuum drainage as well freezing and, and vacuum drainage uh, but it is yes, very, I think it started they, they originally 
they originally did that on the on the water tunnels, and that was then transferred uh, that knowledge to the well, to the road tunnel. Hmm. I'm I'm interested in your saying that. It's something of which I'm not aware, but I would be interested to know more. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll put you and Peter in touch again, Tony. So you, you've got some um, additional research work coming in here, information. Yep. Tony, could you expand on vacuum drainage? No, because I know nothing about it. <laughs> you, 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 you say it with such a problem, and, and I don't know how it works either. Anybody here who knows what vacuum drainage, how it works? You get rid of the water by sucking it away. <laughs> anyway, I, I just want to use this opportunity to, to say to you guys, we, we next week we're going to try something new. We're going to have our breakfast talk. We can accommodate 20 local people and we'll also try and have it Zoomed. So this will be the first time we combine both of these methods. So bear with us if there are any technical issues, but we're looking forward to, to seeing most of you next week. Okay, thank, thanks, Henny, and thanks, Tony. That was really most interesting and glad that we had um, some good discussion and there were a few areas you need to brush up on that you missed out. So we'll, we'll expect um, another talk sometime with some of those those inputs. And thanks to everyone for, for attending this morning. Um, most appreciate it. Any last questions? Yes. Adele? No, okay, anyone else? Thank you very okay. much, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks, Tony. Right. Thanks, Tony. Enjoy the Bye. rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much from Rosemary and Arnold, too. Bye. Thanks, Rosemary. Bye. Thanks, Tony. Hope this, maybe we'll see you sometime. Yeah, Cheers, John. That. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Tony. Cheers, Andrew, as well. Yeah. Cheers, John.